Um, yes, it's Harry Koponen or Harry for short. Um, I'm actually wearing two hats today. Um, Bisma, you might have heard of that. Uh, we recently shuffled the group ownership at a valuation of uh, 12.2 billion US dollars, which is reasonably large by Nordic standards. Then there's a slightly uh, small organization, uh, Lut University, which is a Finnish university. Uh, which, on the other hand, solves wicked problems in sustainability uh, and business renewal, for instance, creating energy, fuel, food out of thin air by, via Power2x technologies. So myself, uh, I'm basically connecting different capabilities, different skill sets, different approaches for the greater good. Right. Okay. Let's see if I can. Now, now it works. Excellent. So basically, you know, the topic, APIs as business development tools. Uh, what does business development in this context mean? Uh, I think it means exactly the same that it uh, means uh, for other types of businesses, getting more of something with relatively uh, less of something. Uh, for instance, the classical ISV, Independent Software Vendor Partnership, which from the originating businesses point of view means offloading customer acquisition and relationship work to another organization typically paying with a share of earnings by definitions by definition apis are just what the doctor ordered to some of it it also allows scalable growth to a much greater degree than scaling human resources in a linear fashion with growth so where do apis stand in all this new customer acquisition Upsales for related services, new functionality, upsales for more transactions, more use, slower churn. So the way I see it is that currently companies pay a lot of money over the long term to avoid paying a small-ish sum upfront. That is to avoid paying for integration work, continuing to pay monthly for manual work via user interfaces and so on. So we all share an opportunity of replacing the traditional whipsaw with a chainsaw. Um, traditional demand analysis is just as valid for production resources, which APIs basically are, uh, as it is for end user goods. So it all starts with sufficient demand, sufficient volume demand for the service. And this is where I hate running domestic businesses in Finland. How much volume can you pull with the five and a half million people if the transaction or the data is anything but most mainstream? So a large market is a must for most types of APIs. Also, it has to do with essential versus non-essential. I mean, just compare an API with payment functionality or something for just incrementally better service. So intuitively, Structured data is what it is all about. But then again, think of all the accounting offices in the world, legal businesses, even the supply chain information bursts into an uncontrollable mess once below a certain company size threshold. So the obvious response for us API providers must be making connecting systems easier. Ready-made integrations, just dropping in your API secrets, that's the royal treatment, if you like. Um, the SDK helps too, but it will take a long time to kill all those intermediate Excel files. So how about async? When you think, should a human really waste one's life checking uh, if there's something new in various systems? This could actually be the killer argument, but we collectively really suck at this, yes. We API people have automated much of our lives, but the general population has experienced a sharp increase in number of potentially relevant notifications and very little tools to simplify one's personal touch point on the personal processes. Luckily, there's a 100% reliable sign that your existing UI-driven business will succeed also on the API front. I'll take an example from NetVisor, a financial ERP by Visma. 
with nightly hordes of robots, or should I say the rise of machines take place. We run ourselves daily batch jobs or nightly batch jobs, etc. But the majority of system load is machines simulating mouse movements and typing. We do have a REST API in place and a powerful effort to level up with the next iteration. But I'd say that a perfect benchmark between API quality and presentation versus the robots is to see when new RPA implementations drizzle to zero and API connections jump up. Interestingly, referring to Alan's talk a few moments ago, uh, the NetBizer marketplace has some vendors from that, from our perspective, provide suboptimal services, that's RPA, and other vendors which are optimal API consumers and business partners connected to our APIs. So you all know the AIDA model, attention, interest, desire, action, and you know that the funnel, the sales funnel, funnel or business development funnel narrows at every phase with more energy and more action needed, invested to pass each gate. But most of us B2B people totally suck at opening the final gate wide open as soon as the prospective customer arrives. The poor client is not even nearly there despite signaling that it's time to hit it. So. We add human interaction, slow, prone to errors, dependent on mood. We necessitate waiting for, for anything really, offline agreements, terms and conditions, legalese, checks, investment decisions, and obviously coding. It could, it could also be immediate availability, you know, smooth code base, matching the customer's environment, direct path to getting the relevant stuff done versus yeah but i want actually wanted to and also a really big thing which has uh, which i've seen in the last two years or so uh rising in importance is uh, conformance gdpr accessibility and so on so the question is are we accelerating the client or piling up obstacles uh, i think this is actually what alan g presented in his talk a few moments ago accelerating the business side of the connection. And the rising tail side, it's the network effect, but only after you have a top NPS customer who has gotten what one needed. It took about three years with this machine, an e-signature service, to eradicate the stuff that killed our developer conversion. At first, we provided some code, bits, snippets, then more code, automated onboarding. We added a partner ABI to empower the ISV partners with massive clientele. We honed and honed the integration support. And now we are at about 22,000 uh, 22, customer organizations. And the network effect is pushing the curve strongly upwards. Unfortunately, there's a very finite number of good API salespeople which I'm sure you are all aware of. You might need to be more nerdy than in many lines of business. You know, there's, there's no shiny things, no shiny pictures for the alpha sales type to thrive on. You need to connect to both business types and tech people to succeed. But what still confuses me is the way too often present lack of basic analytical sales approach when providing APIs. Since this is way more complex than selling toothbrushes, it's much more important to ensure that you understand what you are trying to achieve and who you are trying to influence at key stages of courting. Some telcos excel at this and have long ago separated several important roles and separated the approach towards each role. For APIs, the exception is that the people implementing the API are the most influential people in this discussion. As many APIs are in a market with active competition and multiple suppliers, the traditional business wisdom would suggest fierce price competition. But we have found that we are mostly already way below the price point called insignificant. And this shifts the focus from satisfying an economy major to meeting the needs and wants of an API developer 
these people are the kings and queens of our API era. And I can tell you, once you need to actually touch a coder's heart, it takes a more, it takes a lot more brothers in arms approach than a hello world in Ruby. A very finite number of good API people indeed. I must say that from the higher education perspective, I'd love to hear your views on the perfect junior API business developer and perhaps benchmark on the institutions that succeed on supply. Now scaling, I'd say that your product is broken if it doesn't automatically scale financially. I repeat, if you, for instance, have a flat rate contract, it must leverage network effect for a stream of new clients. If not, your revenue must scale with customers' increased use. No other options. Please just don't do it. Way too many companies struggle in the financial death valley because of this. A different ball game, obviously, is when you actually have multiple products under a common brand. For example, Maventa, an e-invoice service, and a node in the European e-invoice operators network. It also has a similar logic, similar interface, a network for e-pay slips. But there's no automation in adopting the next trans uh, transaction type after the first one. So more sales effort is needed for the step up in usefulness for the customer and for increased revenues for the company. This is despite the existing technical connection, benefiting a lot from the original integration. That bit actually should be the key in upsales of both all services of the same company or group. If there's no synergy from customer's point of view, uh, you are knowingly losing your potential and exposing the customer to competing vendors unnecessarily. So please, Make sure that you have at least some shared elements between your pieces of offering. It could be some technical elements. It could be authentication, shared super support line for uh, parties integrating to your APIs, or anything that immediately removes one of the unnecessary A's from the AIDA AA, AA model. APIs have already backfired on quite a few business models, so let's be careful out there. For instance, pricing based on the number of users, human users, that is, the majority of them could easily be gone once the API route is open. Is your service operated via a user interface and provides the central hub for users? It could well be that the action takes place elsewhere soon. You may well end up being a farmed resource instead of running it all. Need proof? Just think of all the services that currently compete on owning the user's workflow. Uh, in fact, some of the hot topics on Nordic markets with regard to financial ERPs have to do with the in intentions of some banks and some governments intending the RAID ERPs uh, provided by private companies for detailed data and running away with their different business models. In the case of Finnish government, there's even talk about entering the financial ERP market with a taxpayer-funded solution. We'll see how that turns out. And finally, from a guy who's do been doing something in the muddy waters between ICT and business since the tender age of, age of 13, I really feel that many tech people have less need for someone holding their hand than some other people in business. I would even say that trying to forcefully engage over the life cycle of a customer relationship might hurt the relation. And the question which is still open from my, in my mind is that how do you get from no need to what could we do next if there's no true connection? So you win some, you lose some at the API market, but always make sure that you are relevant to the ones pulling the strings. So this is your friendly API unicorn, politely suggesting that the ease of buying and the ease of implementation will override any and all other business development efforts. Obviously, your mileage may vary, but taking this approach, never has failed. So I conclude my presentation with these visible values. Thanks for joining. 
and looking forward to meeting you at Q&A at 5.15 Eastern European time. Harry, hi, thank you um, so much for sharing uh, your insights and experience from clearly the many years of uh, uh, both very hands-on and thoughtful uh, uh, insights into um, uh, what you've been doing at Visma and through your academic research as well. Um, Pleasure. Thank you. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm curious about um, uh, one of the things you talked about was uh, introduction of automation and when uh, and that actually uh, um, looking at tools, uh, solutions, RPA types of um, opportunities as potentially deteriorating over time through uh, the introduction of, um, you know, and, and uh, exploitation, if you like, of, of more and more useful APIs. I was wondering if you could expand a bit on some examples of, of where you see that might be changing in the customer management business development arena. Um, yeah, actually, I'd, I'd say it's a, it's not a new phenomenon, obviously, because uh, if you sort of shift your focus from providing ICT services to providing um, resources for production or production elements, uh, the same type of uh, relationship development over a long time, sort of upgrading, adding value, and also leveraging the networks of the uh, organizations that you directly work with has been there for decades or I don't know, probably for centuries. But um, what now has become available uh, is the data. So when you're providing services via uh, APIs, if you are not running really in-depth analytics, if you are not trying to extract insights and turn it into an action on the business side, you are really losing opportunities. And this is something that we have not traditionally been all that good at. We've uh, looked at the immediate relationship between ourselves and the consumer of the API when we should be looking at the ecosystems and sort of shifting the focus further away. Oh, that's great. And, and a very um, a very good uh, connection and entree in from uh, the conversation with Alan uh, just earlier. Um, we're going to have the opportunity to um, invite you back uh, to to, um, uh, to discuss with Alan and also to talk with with our next speaker. Um, so if you if you're um, I don't see that there are any questions more from the stage, but uh, we're certainly getting plenty of compliments for um, uh, a, a great insightful talk. So thank you. We look forward to seeing you in uh, just Thank over you. 10 minutes. See you later. Great. Thank you, Harry.